Hi, I'm Dave Wolfball. I'm the veterinarian here at the Lakeville Animal Hospital. And this is George. George was born in 2009. He was a stray and he was adopted by one of the people who volunteers here. And we're going to use him as a demonstration. Uh, basically on, is he a thin cat, a happy cat, a fat cat? And we're going to talk a little bit about uh, feeding cats. Uh, George is a house cat, so he doesn't get a whole lot of exercise. And it's amazing how little food, how few calories. These guys actually need to maintain their body weight. And if you take a look at George, he's uh, kind of round. He's also very gentle, as you can see. Uh, George weighs about 14 pounds, and he probably should weigh about 12. Doesn't sound like a lot, two pounds, but when you weigh 14 pounds, that's a large percentage of his body weight. He also likes being petted a lot. Anyway, how do you know if your cat is too heavy? Well, like most critters, if you can put your fingers on their chest, like this, with their bum facing you and their head the other way, run your fingers backwards, you should be able to feel their ribs. If you can't feel their ribs, there's a little bit too much tissue between your fingertips and the ribs. Well, I have to look for his. Yeah, George, sorry, you need a diet. George currently eats predominantly dry food. And for decades, veterinarians have said, yes, dry food, feed your cats dry food. It's certainly less expensive, it's a lot easier, you can just leave it out. Problem is, cats are obligate carnivores. They're actually built to digest protein and fat. They burn protein and fat. We burn carbohydrates. Well, if you give a cat predominantly carbohydrates, and most dry foods are a carbohydrate base, of course they have protein in it, they have to. But if you give a cat, or any other critter, stuff that they can't utilize, well, what do you do with that extra stuff? Well, you end up putting it here and here and here. And if you do too much of that, eventually you end up looking like me. I've been battling my weight all my life. One thing people always ask, well, gee, if I start feeding my cat canned food instead of dry food, doesn't that take away the abrasive element uh, of removing tartar from the teeth? And yes, it does. But what is forgotten is that most of tartar, most of stain, all that plaque, is actually made up of carbohydrate. So if we decrease the carbohydrate intake, we will also be decreasing some of the plaque formation. Problem is, it's the easiest way to feed a cat. We recommend actually feeding them primarily canned food. It's a little bit more difficult, but they actually do better. Um, the average house cat will eat about one of the five and a half ounce cans per day. Now, George is a big guy. He would probably eat a little bit more. And the recommendation would be to feed him in the morning, feed him in the evening, so twice a day feeding, set meal times so there's not food out all the time. You put the food down, when they're done, you pick it up, you take it away. They do get used to this. One of the problems with doing this, though, is there are some cats, and I own one, who will not eat canned food. They're used to eating dry food. So when you try and switch them over, they look at this stuff and they go, I'm not going to eat this stuff. And cats will literally starve to death surrounded by food if they don't recognize it as food. Which brands? Honestly, any of the major national brand cat foods are just fine. If you feel like you want to feed one of the premium brands, absolutely fine. Uh, if you want to stick with something that is not a Cadillac, as it were, that's also fine. The only foods we recommend that you stay away from are really the house brand foods. Um, those are the ones that traditionally we've had issues with digestive upsets. Stick with the major national brands. Believe it or not, um, you know, people think of you know, Purina as a big, huge company. They don't do anything. They put a ton of money into nutritional research. IMS puts a ton of money into nutritional research. And a lot of what we've learned about feeding these critters over the years comes from a lot of the research funded by the big companies. Does that mean they make the best food? Not necessarily. Does that mean they make the worst food? Not necessarily.
but they do put a lot of money into that research, and we rely on that a lot. That's the nice. dry foods that are grain-free, um, it's more of a marketing ploy than it is a true nutritional benefit. Uh, are there benefits to antioxidants in their diet? Absolutely. Um, people will think, oh, this thing's got blueberries and cranberries and all these natural antioxidants. That's wonderful, except they can't digest them. They have to be in a form that's digestible to the cat. Um, Grain-free, all natural. Honestly, these are marketing ploys to a large degree. Um, as far as all natural, as a, uh, an example, has absolutely no legal standing when it comes to pet food. I don't claim to be an expert on human labeling, so don't quote me on that. But as far as pet foods go, it has absolutely no legal value. It is a marketing ploy. Does it mean it's all natural? Yeah, that, it might be. But does it have a value to the cat? Not at all. Or the dog, for that matter. The raw diets, there's a lot of controversy on raw diets. Most nutritionists will say, stay away from raw diets. And that's a blanket statement that they will make. Um, a lot of people who are going to hear this are going to go, oh, that's scary. But uh, there was a study published, I'm going to say I saw it about six weeks ago, maybe two months ago. Approximately 20% of all the, the uh, raw diets have some kind of a... No, now you're purring, thank you. Have some kind of a bacterial contamination, whether it's salmonella or clostridia or E. coli, which have been linked to very severe GI upsets. That's 20%. That's a lot. Uh, and this is across the board. This isn't a particular company. This is all of them. So most veterinary nutritionists, I do not claim to be a veterinary nutritionist, but most of them will say stay away from raw diets completely. Feeding cats senior foods or uh, kittens kitten food. Kittens on kitten food, yes. Kittens are growing, just like children. Their nutritional requirements are a little bit different. They need more protein, they need more calories, certainly per unit volume. Uh, we definitely recommend feeding kitten food to kittens up until they're pretty close to a year old. Somewhere between six months and a year is when I usually tell people start changing over to adult cat food. Uh, it used to be a year, now it's more six months, and the reason is there's more calories in the kitten food. Uh, so we try and avoid getting young cats too heavy too fast. On the other hand, I'm going to go off topic for a minute. If you have a debilitated cat, a cat that's weak or is ill or needs a little bit extra, feeding kitten food is very often a very good idea. Senior cats, should they be fed a senior diet? The idea is great, but often the execution isn't. Um, a lot of the senior diets have way more calories than the cat needs, and as cats and people become seniors, we tend to become more sedentary. And because of that, we're now giving the cat nutrition that, again, he can't utilize or she can't utilize. Well, now what? Now you end up with a fat cat again. So as a rule, unless you've got a cat with a debilitating problem, you can use a senior diet, but check and make sure that your calorie content isn't any worse or higher than the calorie content of the food that you were eating because if you feed the same amount, you will end up with a fat cat. Another thing to think about, don't change food on cats quickly. Do it gradually. If you feed your cat food X on Monday and food Y on Tuesday, I will be seeing your cat with a tummy upset on Wednesday. They don't deal well with really quick diet changes. Mix the food in, gradually change them over. You'll be far more likely to accept it. Most, in fact, just about every cat food out there is going to be nutritionally complete. One thing you should look for on every food you buy, somewhere on the can, the box, the bag, there's going to be an AFCO statement, A-A-F 
AFCO. And it's usually not very big, but AFCO is the organization that monitors nutritional composition of cat foods. AFCO will put this label on every cat food and it will state this food has been formulated to meet the nutritional requirements of, and then it will either say all life stages, or it may say kittens, or it may say adult cats. If it says all life stages, you can feed it to anybody. Cat, kitten, adult, nursing, pregnant. If it says mature cats, do not feed this to kittens. The other thing that it will do is the AFCO statement will state, has this been tested through feeding trial or has it been formulated? If it's been formulated, that doesn't mean it's a bad food, but it has never gone through a formal trial on animals. Ideally, a feeding trial is better. You know what you're dealing with. That doesn't mean that a formulated food is bad. It just means it has not been formally tested. Some cats will eat dog food. Now, a dog can survive on cat food. A cat will not survive on dog food. The nutritional requirements are way too different. Is it going to harm your cat to go over and take a bite of dog food? Not at all. Uh, my dog used to share his food with the cat. The cat would come over, the dog would be eating, the cat would sneak underneath and grab a bite, and the dog would go, yeah, okay. And feeding multiple cats. The ideal, what the experts will say, is every cat should have his own dish so that you don't have fights and squabbles over cat food. Um, and I tend to agree with that, but it also really depends on how your cats have been raised. Uh, we have in our house um, two cat dishes, but they're not considered, the experts would not consider them two cat dishes because they're right next to each other. That, as far as the cat is concerned, is one big dish. However, my cats have always been good with each other. They'll sit next to each other. They'll each eat out of their own bowl. We do the same when, um, uh, when at set meal time, when the canned food goes down, canned food goes down. Yours is here, yours is here, we stand here. You're done? Great. Oh, you left some. Off he goes. You're done? No, you're still eating. You want to go finish his? Fine, he's done. Go ahead. Can you give your cats milk? There's only one reason not to give your cat milk. If your cat has a lactose intolerance, you will learn very quickly not to give your cat milk. It will give them loose stool. Will it harm them to get milk? Only if they have a lactose intolerance. Do they need milk? No. It's a snack. It's a treat. It's a goodie. Should it be part of their regular diet? No, I wouldn't recommend it. But it's not wrong to give it. Just like anything else, it's a treat. It's a snack. It's a goodie. Is it wrong to eat a Snickers bar? There's nothing wrong with a Snickers bar. I just wouldn't want to make an entire lifestyle out of eating Snickers bars as my main meal. Giving table food is a Snickers bar. And you can chop a little bit up of something that's cooked, not raw, and add it to their canned food uh, periodically. Do you have to? No. Do they like it? Probably. Um, I have had cats who love tomato sauce. So when there's anything left from a homemade pizza, they get a little bit of tomato sauce. Will it harm them? Not at all. Now, of course, just like people, there are things that cats should not eat that are dangerous. Okay? The grapes. You want to stay away from that. Far more so with dogs than with cats. Most cats aren't going to eat them. Um, you have to be very careful, believe it or not, with a lot of things that are not necessarily considered food items, but cats can't stay away from it. One of the big ones is antifreeze. If your cats go in and out of your garage, if you've got antifreeze leaks, Antifreeze, for the most part, tastes sweet. No, I do not know this from personal experience, but some cats will lick this up, and it's incredibly toxic. Very, very toxic. So if you do your own work on cars and your cat is hanging around, be very careful you don't leave stuff like that out because they will get into it. Certain houseplants can be very toxic. All of the lilies are very dark. There's no part of the lily that will not do something, even if all it is is upset your tummy. 
that still is not cool. And lilies are very popular as ornamental plants. Well, when was the last time you had a cat that completely ignored all your ornamental plants? The only plant I know that they ignore is cactus. And there's a reason for that. Um, spider plants, not toxic, but boy, the cats will do a number on them. <laughs> So that's my basics on nutrition in cats. Weechi is about nine months old, um, and he is a house cat. He's adorable. He has the typical pushed-in face of the Himalayan. Also, uh, you'll see this on rag dolls to a large degree, and of course you'll see it on Persians. And because of that, he also has a little bit of uh, discharge from his eyes. And a lot of these guys will have this permanently. There's not much you can do about that in a lot of these kitty cats with the shortened face. We actually wanted to use Weechi as an example uh, or have him in the foreground as we talk about a couple of other things. Uh, we want to talk a little bit about AIDS and leukemia in cats. AIDS and leukemia are two viruses that are transmitted almost always by contact with another animal that has one of these viruses. So let's talk about AIDS first. Okay, the feline AIDS virus is transmitted almost always by bite wounds and fight wounds. So an indoor cat is not likely to get exposed to this, but a cat that goes outside and gets bitten can. Now it's very common for these cats who have this, that they are completely normal. You can diagnose it on a routine screening test, and they will be normal for years and years and years and years, very similar to the human HIV virus. The problem is that the virus will, at times, shut down your immune system. And we don't know if you're going to have this occur when you're a year old or two years old or five years old, or 14 years old, or never. So when you have a cat that has been tested and has been diagnosed positive with the AIDS virus, it's not a death sentence, but it does change how you should treat your kitty. If you have a cat that is feline AIDS positive, they can live a normal life, they can do pretty much everything, but they really shouldn't be allowed outside because if they get into a tussle with somebody else and bite them, that's how they're going to spread the virus to other cats. The reverse is also a problem. Since we don't know if their immune system is going to remain competent throughout their life, if they get into a tussle, even if it's a minor thing, we have to treat it very aggressively because we don't know if their immune system is going to respond appropriately. So, AIDS-positive cats should stay indoors, ideally, and ideally they should be the only kitty in the household because, again, they can get in a tussle with the, their housemate and then transmit the virus to them. Are people at risk from AIDS? No. Feline AIDS is feline AIDS. Cats only. You cannot get this from your cat. Now leukemia is a little bit different. Leukemia in cats, leukemia of course, come on back here young man, is a virus that is transmitted by everything that comes out of the cat. So urine, feces, blood, saliva, tears, you name it, the cat will have this virus in that tissue. So if they sneeze on each other or cough on each other, they can transmit this. Now these viruses don't live very long outside of the body. They need moisture. So if you had a cat that was absolutely loaded with virus and was on a surface and the, had moisture on there, the virus would stick around until that dried up. Once it's dry, it's no longer contagious. Now leukemia, of course, being a blood cancer, is really quite dangerous. Most cats who test positive for leukemia will not survive more than a few years, and they will die of leukemia or the leukemia-related effects. Again, their white blood cells will not respond, and you will end up with all these other secondary problems, 
dental disease, kidney disease, solid tumors throughout the body, not nice things. So what do you do when you get a new kitten? How do you know if your kitten has AIDS or leukemia? It's a blood test. And uh, unfortunately, I kind of skipped over this part, but it's important. Both of these viruses can be transmitted from mother to offspring while the kittens are in utero, while mom is pregnant. So if you have a kitten and you test it and the kitten is negative, negative is negative, great. If the kitten is positive, is that a true positive? Not necessarily with the AIDS virus. With the AIDS virus, they can get a transient viremia. In other words, the virus is in the bloodstream, but it doesn't stick. So you want to retest those cats when they're about six months old. If they are still positive, unfortunately, yes, they are. But most cats that are ex exposed in utero will turn negative, and these cats do not have AIDS. Leukemia, different. Leukemia, if you're positive, most of the time you will remain positive. Should you retest the leukemia positive cat? Yes, because you want to be sure. But most of the time that's not a good deal and most of the time that cat will not survive. Okay, you have a leukemia positive cat. He's perfectly healthy at the moment. You know he's probably going to have a shortened lifespan. What do you do? By the way, this guy is completely fine, so we don't have to worry about Weechi. But with a leukemia positive cat, again, you can keep him indoors. He should ideally be the only cat in the household. Remember that a stress, again, we don't know if his immune system is going to respond. He can do whatever he wants as an indoor kitty, because if he goes outside, he can transmit it to somebody else, and he's more at risk for something coming in and stressing his immune system. You just have to remember that that kitty will probably not live a normal lifespan. And that is the basics of AIDS and leukemia. Hi. I'm Dave Wolfthal. We're here in front of the Lakeville Animal Hospital, and this is my dog, Barkley. Barkley is 12. Um, he's actually from the Lakeville Animal Shelter. And as you can see, when he turns towards the camera, he has cataracts in both eyes. He's completely blind, which is why he's on leash. Otherwise, we'll go wandering off. But we're going to talk a little bit, not about his blindness, but about tick control. Uh, this is early May. Fleas and ticks are starting to make their unwanted appearance, and Lyme disease is a major problem in this part of the country. Um, there's a fellow who's the director of the Animal Medical Center in New York City. He gave a lecture in this part of the world uh, July of 2013, so not quite a year ago, and he made a statement that really stuck with me. He said, nature is going to try and give your dog Lyme disease. And if you do nothing, nature will win. So, how do you prevent Lyme disease in your dog? Barkley, you want to come around this way? That's my boy. Come on. I know, I know. You have to find the perfect blade of grass. Anyway, Lyme disease is transmitted by ticks. That is the only way that you or your dog is going to get Lyme disease. And we've got several different types of ticks in this part of the country. The most important one for Lyme disease transmission is the deer tick. And since we have deer, we have a lot of deer ticks. The ticks live in grassy areas. They do not fall out of trees, as some people think. Brushy areas. They attach themselves to the dog. And they can be really hard to find. Uh, the deer tick nymph, the Im immature tick, is literally the size of the period in newsprint. So if you can try and find something like that in this guy's coat, you can see it can be really difficult to do. So the three things that you can do to help prevent Lyme disease. Number one, the single most important thing is some form of flea and tick control on your dog. There are many, many, many different things out there. A lot of them are very, very, very effective. Um, the topicals are very effective as a rule. There's a new collar out, which I've just started Barkley on, um, which we're going to see how well that works on him. The reports we have of it are terrific. 
There's also um, a new oral product that has recently been started, and that looks like it's very good. The topicals are all monthly. You apply them once a month, every month, all year long, you never stop. The flea and tick collar that we're talking about, and most veterinarians know about this, you can check with your own, um, that lasts for approximately eight months. So there is a tremendous advantage in that you don't have to do anything for eight months. Just make sure that it's always on and it's on properly. So, number one, flea and tick control. Number two, every time your dog comes in from outside, check and see if you can find any ticks. If you can, remove them. Remove them with an instrument. Don't use your fingers. If you use your fingers and you're like most people, you have little nicks and cuts and scratches, you run the risk of exposing yourself to whatever is inside that tick if that tick breaks and spills blood all over your hands. So use an instrument, use a tweezer. Okay, flea and tick control, removing of ticks, and the third thing, and it is the third, not the first or the second, is vaccinate your dog for Lyme disease. There is a vaccination. It has been proven to be safe and effective. The vaccine is given under the skin two doses. Those two doses are given two to three weeks apart. If you're really outside that two to three week range, you're going to have to start over again. It's also been shown that the vaccine is far more effective than if it's given a booster six months later. Now, that's not a manufacturer's recommendation, but that's actually uh, a recommendation that came out of Cornell University that researched this. So, flea and tick control, remove ticks, vaccinate. The vaccine is boosted yearly. What are the signs of Lyme disease in your dog? Well, very similar to people, lameness. I'm sore, I hurt. Uh, we see a lot of dogs who come in and they are literally holding a leg up. You'd think that, oh my God, my dog broke his leg or twisted his ankle. And actually what it is, is Lyme disease. In people, you may have seen people who've been diagnosed, they have this round rash around their, uh, their tick bite. Uh, I don't know if anybody here has ever seen anybody that's developed that rash. It looks like a great big round red circle, almost like a bullseye. They call it the bullseye rash or the target rash. It's never been shown in dogs. First of all, you can't find it in all the fur. Second of all, they just don't seem to get it. Uh, the reason for this rash is that's the Lyme bacteria. This is a bacterial disease that just migrates out from the tick bite and since the bacteria doesn't know where it's going. It just migrates out in all directions, so you'll end up with a circular rash. So you can get lameness. You can get fever. You can get cardiac issues. There have been uh, incidents of neurologic issues, so you have a dog who literally is acting like he's having a brain issue. It can be a royal pain in the neck to diagnose in terms of just looking at the dog, because it mimics so many things but it's pretty easy to diagnose in the hospital with a relatively simple blood test. Uh, this test also checks for heartworm disease, which we can talk about later, and it checks for a couple of other tick transmitted diseases, Ehrlichia and anaplasmosis. Now, all of these are transmitted by tick bites. You do have to be bitten. The tick doesn't walk all over you. You have to have a tick bite. They can be rather nasty. They all have very similar signs. Uh, they can give you fever. They can give you lameness, joint pain, skin rashes. We don't know if dogs get the same long-term chronic problems that people get, but they do tend to get kidney disease, which can be very, very nasty. In fact, it can be deadly. Hi, Barkle. So the diagnosis with a blood test the blood test that's used in the hospital does differentiate between a dog that's positive because he's been vaccinated uh, versus a dog that has been exposed in the wild. In fact, a dog that's been vaccinated, you're not going to see anything on that blood test. Whereas a dog that's, been, vac that's uh, been exposed in the wild, those dogs will show up positive. And if they do, then your doctor will talk to you about how do we go about treating him? How do we go about diagnosing the severity? Treatment is really pretty simple. Uh, it is done with an antibiotic. The most common one is doxycycline. It's given twice a day, and it's given for 28 days. Some doctors will even give it for a little bit longer. 
and some doctors will only give it once a day. That's still considered okay. It's in the normal dose range. You do it for a full 28 days. Okay, your dog unfortunately came down with Lyme disease. You've treated him. How do you know? You've treated him successfully. Well, that's a whole nother series of blood tests for a whole nother topic. Again, your veterinarian will talk to you about that. As a rule, dogs who test positive for Lyme disease can remain positive on that screening test that's done in the hospital for an incredibly long time. Doesn't mean that they will, but they can. The bacteria never seems to leave the body. It's always there. So these dogs will have a low-grade immune reaction to that bacteria, and lo and behold, it's two years later, it's three years later, it's four years later, they've never been ill a day in their life since then, and they're still testing positive for Lyme disease. And some dogs will actually test positive for the remainder of their life. It's still a disease we're learning a lot about, but it is an important one, especially because dogs kind of act as a sentinel. Uh, if the dog has got Lyme disease, and the dog is in your area, and you go where the dog goes, you're likely to be exposed to the same ticks that the dog is. And we see a lot of people who come in and they have Lyme disease, and we go, uh-oh, the dog's lame. I wonder if the dog picked it up at the same time the person did. Certainly picked it up in the same place that the person did. So that's our song and dance on Lyme disease. If you have any questions, give us a call here at the Animal Hospital. The phone number is 508-947-1309. We'll be happy to answer them. Uh, we're here well, Monday through Friday uh, and part of Saturday. There are rare occasions when I'm not here. I get an emergency or unfortunately I get ill too.